As the News Limited broadsheet ploughs on into middle age, it'll soon be 40, a trip to the archives seemed warranted. Here's Rupert still showing signs of puppy fat, speaking in 1967 of his priorities. Oh, the Australian, I think, certainly at the moment. It's been the greatest challenge uh, and the biggest, certainly the biggest task that I've had. The biggest challenge I've had put before me, I think, in life yet. It's de rigueur for any Murdoch story to remind us of how hands-on he was at the launch of the Australian. So here are all the cliché shots once again. Rupert working on the stone, Rupert pulling out one of the first copies of his new broadsheet, Rupert on the subject of his power as a nascent press baron. Do, do you like the feeling of power you have as a newspaper proprietor, of being able to sort of formulate policies for a large number of newspapers in every state of Australia? Well, there's only one honest answer to that, of course, and that's yes. Uh, of course one enjoys the feeling of power. The Oz overcame almost insuperable production crises, not infrequently by means of Murdoch's pre-whopping tricks, but still took more than 20 years to stop hemorrhaging money. From this, the front page of volume one, number one, with its gauche good intentions. It will be our duty to inform Australians everywhere of what is really happening in their country. It has become this, a slim paper certainly, but padded out with strong specialist sections whose advertising revenue is the tail wagging the news pages dog. Yet the one thing the Oz can't achieve is a competitive circulation. It now sells about 130,000 copies Monday to Friday, which isn't so much more than the Financial Review, and substantially less than the number of people who watch ABC TV's gardening program. Murdoch's Sydney and Melbourne tabloids outsell the Australian by something like four to one, and in all the capital cities, only one paper in every six sold is Murdoch's bid for broadsheet respectability. So why is it so influential? The short answer is its readers, not just ABC radio producers throughout the country, but also those champion narcissists, our politicians. Which brings me back to my earlier point about the Australian's advocacy of Murdoch's God-given right to the digital television spectrum. Friday's front page pressure on Howard was opportunistic to say the least. The shortfall on top of a range of recent hurried spending decisions leaves the budget and the Howard government's economic management credentials under a cloud in the run-up to the May 2001 budget and an election later this year. No doubt John Howard will read that as a threat, and he'll be right. Michelle Gilchrist followed up with the offer Costello is supposed not to refuse drop the raft of rules that makes the data casting spectrum much less attractive and thus less valuable. There's the sweetener. Let Murdoch in on Murdoch's terms and he'll buy you out of your little budget problem. If you don't, well, we know where you live. It's on the front page of our tabloids. There's nothing new about the pressure being exerted on the government by the Oz. It's a campaign with considerable history. But budgetary shortfalls have added urgency. The decision to restrict digital data casting, I'll spare you the details and technicalities, it's sufficient to say Murdoch sees it as a way to broadcast free to air when he can't get a license to do that, was made in December 1999. In the Oz, Fanola Burke was assigned to whinge about it. Welcome to the new age of Australian digital television, just like the old one. Have we learned nothing in 45 years of media policy? There are few places in the world so bound up in media ownership restrictions. Yesterday, the Howard government sanctioned another one, a limit on who can be the gatekeepers of content in the digital world. It was a tag team event with Michelle Gilchrist jumping into the ring alongside Burke. As for News Limited, the rules mean it can do virtually nothing in the news sector of data casting. This is no surprise, but still a disappointment. To whom one wonders. More muscle in the same edition's business section. Picture perfect TV ruling for Packer. Well, what's a politician to do? Scylla and Charybdis. And Scylla, National Nine News, is marginally more important than the whirlpool of the Murdoch tabloid's wrath. Mark Westfield was hard at the HMV duty too, anti-Howard. 
He has singled out News Limited, publisher of The Australian, as a demonic force seeking to ravish the Australian public in pursuit of its commercial interests. Yet he's been happy to roll over to the interests of the commercial networks, who've served Australians so appallingly over the past 45 years with third-rate programming while reaping fat profits. Which belong by divine right to Westfield's employer. Westfield and Burke had earlier combined to run the Murdoch taunt that Howard was being bullied by Packer. Rupert Murdoch has attacked the Howard government's refusal to embrace the Productivity Commission's call to deregulate its media rules, suggesting it was intimidated by some of the existing players. Back to Ms Burke, who soon gave up any pretense of objectivity. The News Corporation Limited is about to shake the foundations of traditional media. Company President Peter Chernin yesterday outlined an aggressive global plan which you will be astounded to hear captured the market's imagination. Having exhausted hers, Finola Burke went off to work for a French bank. Lest there be any doubt as to Howard's vulnerability to attacks on his character run in the Australian, perhaps this will jog your memory. The government's bailout of National Textiles, Chairman Stanley Howard. Not just a cartoon in the Oz. How much is there in the Treasury this week? How many brothers have you got? But also Westfield on page one. It is difficult not to gain the impression that Howard is protecting his brother. He denies this. He has no business, though, interfering in complex matters like company administrations, particularly when his brother is involved and an editorial in even blunter terms. It is improper. This must raise the issue of favouritism, if not corruption. That is certainly defamatory, but braver men than Howard have drawn the line at suing Murdoch. All he could do was call a media conference. I have never sought in any way to favour any member of my family as far as the decisions of the government are concerned. And this rotten attempt uh, to suggest that this decision was designed uh, to do that uh, is one that I uh, emphatically repudiate. He went further. And uh, it's a despicable slur on me uh, and on the other members of the government. An extraordinary and probably unwise reaction for a Prime Minister to make, telling the Australian how thin-skinned he was to its barbs and merely adding power to its elbow. It seems to me this His Master's Voice stuff has become more blatant and unashamed since Paul Kelly, former editor-in-chief, was told to go into the News Limited library where he would find a pistol. Kelly valued editorial independence even if he didn't always achieve it and supported his staff. We aim to have the best news, the best analysis and the best features. I mean, that is the objective which I've defined for the Australian. Kelly's Australian was characterised by density not just in its physical character with closely set type, but look at it now. Much more white space, a sort of light Oz in content and style. Kelly made mistakes. He certainly should not have accepted an appointment to the Australia Indonesia Institute, where he stood too close to Suharto. And the perception was that he was also too close to Keating. Still come back, Paul, all is forgiven. Since little Lockie gave you the elbow for running a paper that was too boring, what's the Oz given us? Ill-advised trivialisation from one Emma Tom, who takes half the feature page to regale us with her moustache waxing. As my eyes and nose streamed like bastards, the beautician let me in on a couple of upper lip waxing secrets. And what she is pleased to call... The female anatomical unit known as the love oven and fashion and lots of it. Little Lockie's belief that there's a whole market out there with spiky hair, Colette Dinnigan frocks and tattoos and they're not reading the Australian. Sadly it would appear Lockie's innovations aren't doing much for revenue. The hip-hop club isn't buying. And while many of the Kelly introduced supplements are performing well, the post-Kelly media lift-out has been nothing but trouble. It's been the vehicle for puff pieces on recently promoted News Limited heavies. Col Allen of the Sydney Telegraph, whose fealty to Rupert is so profound that he even mimics his accent. And John Hartigan, a sort of more respectable Steve Dunleavy, the new CEO of News Limited. 
In this vast piece, you'll find not one word of criticism of Hartigan. Leafing past the non-revenue house ads Foxtel features heavily, you find that old gutter press man, Mark Day, pushing for Rupert, bagging the age, bagging the age again, a third time, joining the Australian's baying pack in pursuit of the digital spectrum for the boss. John Howard and Richard Alston, and indeed the entire Australian Parliament, are the laughing stocks of the digital world. And pushing Foxtel. Pay TV is growing and increasingly flexing its muscles in the advertising world. Oh, really? Care to disclose its pathetic revenue? I thought not. And the averse of all this enthusiasm for toadying is newfound intolerance at the Australian for people trying to practice journalism. Notably, Errol Simper, dropped from the Weekend Australian and not cited since because, it's been suggested, his position on the ABC under Jonathan Shire doesn't fit with News Limited's aspirations for certain commercial synergies. Hence the truly pathetic dossier series promised as a telling probe into the ABC, but hopelessly shallow. And editorials backing Shire. And Amanda Mead, relieved of her column in the media section, reportedly because she dared to describe the big Australian thus. That well-known foreigner, Rupert Murdoch. So what does that leave us? An Australian that's lost a lot of weight and credibility. Shelley Gare is permitted to write in defence of her boyfriend, one of those tax-evading Sydney barristers, when she should not have been. And that still lacks a readership appropriate to its self-estimation. It's obvious that Murdoch believes newspaper ownership is about influence, not news. He even banned journalists from an appearance he made at the Columbia School of Journalism three weeks ago. Members of the working press huddled in the wintry chill outside, standing beneath the statue of Thomas Jefferson. The Fairfax Herald had the story, as did the ABC. The Australian, however, knew upon which side its bread was buttered. I mean, how could that newspaper report with a straight face? that when asked if it was proper to slant news coverage to influence a politician to serve his interests, Murdoch answered, No, I don't think that would be very proper. I don't ever do that. He's a wag, isn't he? Good night to you.